Thanks oh, for coming along this afternoon. Pleasure. Yeah, so perhaps we, we could go back to the beginning. Um, Must we? <laughs> <laughs> we'll start there and uh, go in decades. Um, so, <laughs> what... what <laughs> <laughs> no, he's right, he's right. Um, <laughs> uh, so, what was it that drew you into acting? First of all, you, you started acting back, back in high school. In uh, befo school. Uh, before high school, actually, at the age of uh, six. Okay. I... Um, starred in our local library's Christmas show of The Prince and the Swineherd, a dual role, and uh, <laughs> that, that was the start of it, really. My, my, I'm an only child, East London, uh, nothing in the family to do with uh, theatre or culture in any way, really. I, I don't think I ever saw my parents read a book. Uh, we didn't have many books, and that, that is why I ended up at the library. I had a, I've been very lucky all my life. Uh, you really are looking at one of the luckiest actors ever. Uh, luckiest people ever, I think. Um, I had a music teacher next door, and, and she introduced me to the world of books uh, and culture, I suppose. And she got me into the local library. Um, I can't remember any Damascene conversion to acting. I think it's something I, I always wanted to do. It was like some rogue gene got into the moment of conception. Um, where it came from, I don't know. Uh, my, my mother did produce an aunt who played the piano, and she said, perhaps I got it from her. Um, they talked about getting things like a disease. <laughs> um, but as far back as I can remember, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and that's, that's what I did. In those days, of course, you could... Shall I stand up? Because yeah. I can't see you and you can't see me. Um, in those days, the kids could play quite <coughs> freely on the street. Um, you, you let the kids out in the morning and they play with their friends, and as did I, making up little stories, dressing up in parents' clothes. I remember once I rifled through uh, the wardrobes, because both my parents were out to work, uh, rifling through the wardrobes, and I found my mother's wedding veil. And I put it on and went out to play with the kids. And um, it was the days of great privet hedges, and running up and down the street, of course, I tore this veil to shreds on the privet hedges. And not for the first time in her life, my mother forgave me and was absolutely wonderful about it. I'm, my luck started with my parents, I have to say. Um, my parents were also my friends, my dear friends. And, and they supported me throughout uh, my, my life when I, was, when I was a child and also when I decided that I wanted to be a professional actor, it was for them like I was going on to another planet. It was a world that they uh, had no knowledge of and a certain amount of fear of because it was totally unknown to them. And yet they supported me. Uh, my first job at the Birmingham Rep, they would come, it was fortnightly, new play every four weeks. They would come up every play and they would uh, see the play and they would uh, eventually start giving me notes. <laughs> <laughs> my, mother, my mother's first note, the first time she saw me on a professional stage, she came, they came backstage and I said, did you enjoy it? And, and my mother said, oh yes son, we loved it. Uh, but um, she said, I've got one criticism. And my heart sank. Yes, yes mum, what was it? She said, well, I think you ought to smile a bit more in the curtain call, because you've got a lovely smile. <laughs> <laughs> but her criticisms did get better as time went on. One of my, one of my precious moments was at the time when they went to, uh, to London to see a play that I wasn't in. I really felt that I'd scored at, at that point. Um, but as, as Michael said, uh, this was all a long time ago. Um, I went, to, I had uh, normal school, um, local primary, local grammar, and then uh, th the other place. Um, <laughs> and uh, 
and when I was there, of course, I acted all the time. I, I did the academic work, along with many of my contemporaries, as and when I could. I got what was called the actor's degree, which was a 2-2. Two -two. Um, <laughs> meant you weren't completely um, dreadful at it all, and there was a spark of academia about you. Um, and I acted all the time. Um, and uh, at the end of three years, um, I wrote various uh, begging letters uh, to uh, repertory companies. It was, I was very lucky, again luck, it was the height of the repertoire system. There were many, many reps all over the country. And one of the most prestigious and the most classical, traditional rep um, invited me to audition, and that was Birmingham. And um, they asked me to audition because they had seen me play um, in, in one vacation. Uh, we did a production of Marlowe's Over the Second, which we took to the open air theatre at Stratford-on-Avon in the Bancroft Gardens. And all the big wigs from Birmingham, I didn't know of course, had seen it and had enjoyed it. So when my begging letter arrived, they said, well, this is the boy we saw playing Edward II. Let, let's give him a chance. So they auditioned me and I uh, got into Birmingham and I stayed there for three years uh, for a uh, monthly rep. So we got through a lot of plays um, in the course of those three years. Um, it was a huge learning experience. It was my version of drama school, really, because I hadn't been to drama school. I'd gone straight from Cambridge to Birmingham. And uh, I learned a huge amount. And of course, it was all in front of an audience. It was all practical learning. It wasn't classroom learning. It was practical learning. And um, at the end of that, uh, one luck, again, luck, huge luck. Um, one Wednesday matinee, I'm playing Shakespeare's Henry VIII, and Laurence Olivier's in the audience. We are not told he's in the audience, but he's on a tour of the, the, the reps to find uh, some fodder, really, for uh, his uh, National Theatre, um, which was going to start that autumn. And uh, I shared a dressing room with Cardinal Woolsey at the time, <laughs> and, and Sir Lawrence came round afterwards, and of course, once we'd picked ourselves up off the floor, the great man came in and said to me, well done, well done, very nice. And then he went over to Cardinal Woolsey and was fulsome in his praise of Cardinal Woolsey. Um, I have to say that I had already got out of all the makeup, <laughs> all the padding, all the wigs, all the moustaches of the lot. Um, so I wasn't looking like Henry VIII. Anyway, he praised Woolsey, um, left, and about 20 to 30 seconds left after, there was a knock on the door, and he came back. And he came over to me, and he said, you were Henry? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, yes. And then he gave me some fools and praise, and a week later offered me a job. <laughs> uh, um, uh, which was at Chichester, which was the second se Ch Chichester season. This is 1963. Chichester is a year old. And I'm, I do understudies. I'm given a lovely part in St. Joan. And that autumn, that company, or 99% of that company, became the first National Theatre, which opened um, on the 22nd of October, 1963, at the Old Vic. Um, luck comes in again. I am down to, it, it, we're going to open with Peter O'Toole's Hamlet, directed by Laurence Olivier. I am down to understudy Laertes, which is going to be played by an actor called Jeremy Brett, who was a young star. Um, just before rehearsals began, Jeremy was <laughs> bought out by Warner Brothers to star in the film of My Fair Lady, playing Freddie Ansford Hill. So instead of getting um, another young star to uh, play Laertes, they upped his understudy, which was me. So the first thing I ever did at the National, uh, luckily, was Laertes to Peter's Hamlet. Um, 
And <clears throat> the end of this story, it, it's rather sweet, because the first night came and all the glitterati of London were there, first night of the National Theatre ever. And there was a big party afterwards in the auditorium and on the stage. And uh, I was boring the arse off everybody by saying, oh, it's, it's the best day of my life. I've just played Laertes to Peter Jules Hamlet and it's my 25th birthday. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this, does it? And I was going around telling everybody it was my 25th <laughs> birthday. <laughs> Until eventually somebody came on stage and called for silence. On walked Shirley Bassey, who sang happy birthday to me. <laughs> that was one for the books, yes. Um, so I, and I stayed with Sir Lawrence for the next seven years. He was my, my mentor, my fellow actor, my director, uh, my god, and ultimately my friend. And I owe him tremendous amount. He was very, very good to the youngsters in the company, the youngsters being people like Michael Gamble and Tony Hopkins. Um, uh, and he was, he was wonderful to us all um, and encouraged us. He had many faces, many hats. He could be a bugger. But um, he, on the whole, he was lovely. And he, 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 one of the plays that he thought he was were absolutely right for was uh, Soulness in The Master Builder, who goes on and on about youth knocking at the door. He was very aware of youth knocking at his door. But it, instead of disliking the youth that was knocking, he encouraged it, um, which said a great deal for, for him as a man, I think, um, and as a fellow actor. And so then um, I, I left the National um, and uh, did telly, films, um, carried on, um, carried on acting. Um, that vaguely is a praise of what happened decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> So, so picking up on that, what um, you've done a lot of work on stage, and coupled with that, you've uh, done television work and starred in films too. What are the the main differences for you? And do you feel acting on stage is, is you know more pure or more more legitimate Ooh. than uh, starring in Hollywood yeah. or uh, being on TV? Uh, <coughs> um, well, yes, of course. Theatre is what it's all about. Um, they say you know, um, television makes you famous, movies make you rich. But the theatre is what it's all about. And for me, certainly, um, the, anything to do with the camera doesn't give, from, this is me talking about me, doesn't give the actor anywhere near the job satisfaction that theatre work does, stage work. When you've played King Lear for four hours, or Hamlet, or Macbeth, or any, any of them, by the end of the evening, you have climbed the Himalayas. And the satisfaction you get from that is enormous. The buzz is, is I can't really describe it, um, which you never get, I never get in front of a camera. Because in front of a camera, you, you literally, <laughs> unless you are a big, big star, uh, um, you're a Brad Pitt or whatever, um, you are fodder because what you give to that camera, um, somebody else is going to decide what bits of what you have given actually get shown. Um, what uh, the sound, need, the, the rhythm, every actor uh, is differentiated from the other actor, um, um, amongst other things, by rhythm and pace. No actors have the same rhythm. But in a film, whatever rhythm you've given can be artificially manipulated in the editing suite. So you, you, you give your all in a scene um, and you do it with everything on you and everything on the other person and then one all together. But then somebody else picks which bits are going where. And, and you have nothing to do with that. So what the public eventually sees is really your performance filtered through somebody else's vision. On stage, it's you. And you are making the artistic... Um, and creative choices that in front of a camera somebody else is making for you. You make them for yourself on stage. It's far more frightening, far more terrifying um, on stage because uh, X number of people are watching you and they're seeing all of you. They're not just seeing your face and 
movies and, theat and television is mainly about face and mainly about these. Um, on stage, it's about this um, and the voice. And that requires a skill, a craft, an art, tricks as well. Not such a nice word as craft, tricks. But actors have lots of tricks. Um, I mean, Gilgul was famous for saying um, when he was doing Hamlet eight times a week that uh, four times um, he was Hamlet. Um, the other four times he sent technique on. Uh, <laughs> And which, in a sense, you have, to, you have to do. I mean, try playing Lear eight times a week. It's, it ain't easy. Uh, but my God, it's wonderful if you can actually get there and survive. I, th I think theatre actors can uh, travel over to film and television easier than somebody who is... Uh, film and television orientated can move over to the stage because the stage requires you to be able to fill a space, uh, to fill the space uh, and make it as real and as audible and as accessible for people right up there <coughs> as for people just there. Uh, that is uh, a skill. Um, it is a vocal, uh, mental, psychological and physical skill and all those things can be pulled back for a camera but it is much more difficult if you are used to the camera the mic everything being picked up every tiny little fretwork being seen and that is a skill of its in itself but then it's very difficult to take all that and blow it up out there so I think the journey for a stage actor to bring it all back in is much easier than to blow it up and, and give it out into a large space. So for me, um, the theatre, the theatre is what it's all about. It's, uh, it's not a lucrative profession, theatre. Um, I don't know any rich theatre actors. Um, but I don't think there's an actor that I know who wouldn't say that the theatre is the place where you feel that you have really achieved something. Um, it's frightening, it's terrifying. You stand in the wings even now thinking what a silly way to earn a living. Why do I put myself through this? Why am I so frightened? Even now am I so frightened? Um, in fact, now I think it's worse. Um, I, I had two years, uh, I suffered dreadfully from something called stage fright for two years and I couldn't go anywhere near stage for two years. Um, and I, I still get intimations of, of that, that, uh, that time, um, but it, it wouldn't uh, stop me. Uh, going into the theatre. And the, again, the theatre, you can, you can go on till you drop. You don't have to retire. You play the Jews, you play the middle-aged. I'm into granddads and things now. And it's great. It's great. Granddads and Leas now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, obviously, one aspect of acting that really appeals to you is this you know, electric engagement you get with the audience. Yes. Um, today, you know, in an era of online streaming, that, you know, uh, videos and films available online. What more do you think can be done to really connect with audience members and have them going out to the theatre? You were involved in the National Theatre Live project, for example, before. What yes. else do you think can be done to regalvanise well, this the, interest in the, going the out to the theatre? The National Theatre Live project is, is, is very interesting. It's very good. Um, terrifying to do. Um, I did, uh, uh, when I was playing King Lear at the Donmar, uh, they, they did one of those uh, National Theatre Live things and we were going out to 300 cinemas. And we got to the Dover beach scene and the stage manager rushed onto the stage and said, stop, stop, stop. Um, and 300 cinemas went blank. Uh, the satellite had blown down and we were all sent back to the dressing room. Uh, and it took about 15 minutes to get the satellite back up. And 
so 50 minutes later, we started the scene. We went back to the beginning of the scene, started again. And um, in 300 cinemas around the country and in cinemas outdoors, everywhere, you know, um, they said that mo <laughs> most people stayed uh, and waited 15 minutes because nobody, was, nobody knew what had happened. Uh, but it wasn't the same. I remember g going back and starting that scene again by the time we got to the end. Uh, no, it had all, no, no, it wasn't right. It had all gone wrong. Um, so it, it, it has its uh, traps. That, uh, that, but it's, it's wonderful for getting all the plays out there. And um, I, th if I, th I think there's a magic in the theatre. If once you've been to the theatre, um, I think it, it's got you. I think it, oh, if what you've seen, you've enjoyed. I mean, if you've been bored to tears by what you've seen, then maybe not. Which is why it's so important for, uh, for youngsters. Uh, to see Shakespeare um, early and to see good Shakespeare, to see accessible Shakespeare, to see understandable Shakespeare early, rather than just read it and be tested on it, uh, because that's, that's the killer for, for Shakespeare. But um, for me, the, the, the whole basis of, of uh, getting Shakespeare, making Shakespeare accessible, is ain't what you say, it's the way what you say it. Um, and uh, a healthy disrespect of punctuation is essential. Um, if you want to make a line mean something, in your interpretation of the character, you make it feel something. If it, you don't want that comma there, you want a full stop, put a full stop. Um, I, I'm not a, a fan of the uh, iambic pentameter rhythm I think the rhythm <laughs> is a killer because uh, it puts you to sleep and, it, and you don't understand it. Shakespeare is difficult, difficult for actors. Um, and if it's difficult for the actors, what do you think it's like for the audiences um, who haven't had all the preparation, all the rehearsal, all the discussion? Um, so if you can make it sound like spoken thought, the way you talk absolutely normally, uh, the way you intone, absolutely normally, the way you bring attitude to it, absolutely normal, as you would a contemporary play, then that immediately makes it accessible to the audience. They don't necessarily have to understand exactly what you're saying, um, because some of the words are archaic, and, and, but if your attitude is right, they know why you're saying it, they know what you're saying, by the way you say it, they don't need to know word by word. Perhaps they, they, that's a bonus if they do, but they don't necessarily need to because your attitude, your tone, everything, your body, everything else about uh, what you're doing tells them what you're, tells them what you're meaning. And it's, and it's got to sound as natural um, and, and as... as uh, as much spoken thought. You've, you've got to think, and you've got to think in a, in a contemporary way too. Um, because to the Elizabethans, um, the sound was contemporary, the thoughts were contemporary. Um, and that's uh, what I try to do. Have yeah. I answered your question? Yeah, yeah, and more, <laughs> and more. <laughs> so you are you are extremely modest about your success, and today you've put a lot of it down to to luck. What else would you suggest apart from being lucky to these youngsters starting <laughs> out today? You know, knocking on these doors, getting in touch with these reps. I I think you need. I when I say luck, I mean luck in the sense of being given the opportunity to strut whatever stuff you've got to strut. Uh, and I have been given many many opportunities. Um, luck in my sense has meant that I've never had to really hustle. I've never had to work the room. Um, it's kind of happened. Uh, you've got to serve the goods once you're, you're given the opportunity. But I, th I think apart from that, obviously, you need a modicum of talent. You don't need a huge talent. You need an aptitude uh, for acting and a love of it and a commitment to it. Uh, you also need stamina. You also need health. Uh, physically, acting is very draining when you're playing the big stuff. 
um, or any and, uh, part that you're on the stage for uh, a long time, uh, even a short time, you, you've got to be physically uh, adept and you've got to, uh, and you've got to be vocally adept, uh, particularly if you're playing one of the big uh, Shakespeareans because the people are going to be listening to your voice for a good three hours. So you've got to be able to play more than one tune with your voice. You've got to be not the entire orchestra, but several of the leading instruments in that orchestra uh, to keep the audience's uh, attention. So you need, you need the talent, you need the vocal dexterity, dexterity, you need the physical stamina and dexterity, um, and also the physical, uh, your own knowledge of your body and what it can do and what it can't do. And then you need the luck, which is the, the thing that says, okay, now here is a chance to show all that. That's where the luck comes in. And while you're showing it, you're, you're learning. Um, don't ever stop. Ever, ever stop learning. Don't stop. Don't ever think you've made it. You've, you've got it. You've cracked it. Um, uh, and don't ever stop discovering and delving and asking. See, when actors uh, in a rehearsal uh, situation uh, an actor was said, the director will give a note or something. He said, "No, no, no, I can't. I can't. My character wouldn't do that. That's out of character. Rubbish. We spend our lives doing things out of character. Uh, situation is what's important, not who you are, but find out who you are in that situation. In that any situation, we're all all capable of doing anything. The situation." tells us, uh, not who we are, but where we find ourselves. Um, that is what is important, so don't ever say, my character wouldn't do that, because your character would, in given circumstances, would. Um, I mean, do you know, Hamlet, uh, he's a mass murderer by the end of the play. He's, the, Hamlet is the, the one great situation play. Anybody can play Hamlet, it's the great personality part. To play Hamlet, uh, it's, it's how you look, how you sound, what charisma you give off, uh, what sex you are. Um, girls have played Hamlet as well as boys. You can be fat, thin, tall, short, black, white. It doesn't matter. What matters is you put that personality, who you are as an actor, and put it into Hamlet's situations. That's when your Hamlet becomes individual. That's when your Hamlet becomes you. It, Hamlet's the one part, don't, don't worry about character in Hamlet. You are Hamlet. Whoever you are, you are him. Now work out how you're going to react as you, not as Hamlet, to all these situations. It's, it's, a, it's the great personality role. And it's, uh, it's wonderful. It was while playing Hamlet that I, I put the worm of doubt in my head that led me to two years... Um, Stage fright. Um, we were um, coming to the end of a world tour. Oh, and that's the other thing, of course, acting. It takes you around the world. You get to see places. And you, um, We took Hamlet in 1979 <coughs> to, to China, the first English-speaking Western company to perform in, in um, Beijing and, and Shanghai. And... Uh, and also, when, when you visit these places as, as part of an acting troupe, you are part of the scene. You are part of what's going on, what's on offer. You're not just a tourist. You do touristy things during the day um, and not, try not to tie yourself out too much for the show at night. But you are there as part of the spirit of whatever city, whatever country you're in, uh, which, is, which is wonderful. We were coming to the end of this tour. We were in Australia. We were in the, uh, Her Majesty's Theatre in Sydney. And it was uh, the last day. We had the matinee in an evening. And during the matinee, uh, our interval was uh, before the nunnery scene. 
So the first thing I had to do after the interval was to be or not to be. When anybody playing Hamlet says to be or not to be, there is a tangible silence on the audience. It's as if everybody comes forward just a little bit more. It's the one line everybody knows. Some know another couple, but everybody knows to be or not to be. And when it's said, there is such, such a silence. Well, I'm in the wings thinking this and, um, <laughs> and, and thinking, you know, wh what a catastrophe if the actor hadn't forgot it. What would happen if they forgot to be or not to be? Anyway, cue came. I went on. I started to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles. And I tried. I didn't know what was coming. What the fuck comes <laughs> Fortunately, I had played Hamlet nearly 400 times. <laughs> and, and automatic pilot took over. And after what to me was a sickening pause, I got back onto it. By which time, every pore in my body had opened. My costume had turned black with sweat. I was pouring sweat. Uh, I got through to the end of the show. Then I had to do it again that night. Uh, I have never been so frightened in my life. I, my toes became talons that gripped the floor to stop me falling over. I was so tense. I, I, it was a terrible performance. But at the end of that, I thought, I, I, can't, I can't do this. I can't do this. I've, I've lost it. I've lost it. Um, I, 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 I kind of put a worm of doubt in my head. I, 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 I was questioning... Um, my ability to act, my desire to act, my love of acting, and all those quest silly questions that people ask an acting. How do you learn your lines? Yes, good question. <laughs> How do I learn my lines? How do you stand up in front of 500 people? Another good question. How do I stand up in front of 500 people? Once I'd asked those questions to myself, uh, I answered them in the negative. No, I can't. I can't do that. No. I, th I thought I could. I, I'm, I never questioned that. I never thought about that. That's what I do. But once I'd questioned it, I couldn't do it. And I couldn't do it for two years. And what got me out of it was the age-old thing, an offer I couldn't refuse, which was uh, the RSC, Stratford. And uh, curiously, I was, in, I was in Bavaria, I was in studios in Munich playing Adolf Hitler <coughs> in a television, uh, American television series based on Albert Speer's autobiography Inside the Third Reich. And I was giving my Adolf. And I am, I'm sitting in a canvas chair when they say there's a phone call for you. Derek, and uh, I'm dressed as Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I took the call, and it was the Royal Shakespeare Company. And they said, we want you to be in next season. And my heart sank. I can't. No, I can't do it anymore. I can't do theatre anymore. And I said, what, what, um, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to play? And they said, we want you to do Benedict in Much Ado, Prospero in The Tempest, Cyrano de Bergerac in Cyrano de Bergerac and Pier Gint in Pier Gint. <laughs> I thought, if I say no to that, I will never work again. I will never be a director again. I've got to do it. Terrified, I said, yes, yes. I've always wanted to be with the RSC and um, now it's an ambition fulfilled and I'll do it. Um, but my heart was in my boots. But... Um, I think it's probably a lesson uh, to learn that if you've got problems like that, the best way of curing them is to face them, just to admit them 
and say, no, 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 you're a big nasty bear, but you're not going to get me, Mr. Bear. Uh, I'm going to punch your nose and you'll run off. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that's what I did, that's what I did. And I, I played those, those four parts. I can't conceive now the number of, number of lines I must have had in my head with those four plays, four huge roles, um, wonderful, wonderful roles. Um, but I've forgotten the question now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's plenty of advice for the, uh, the youngsters of today. Right, great. The questions. Let's, yeah, let's take some questions from the audience. OK, so uh, first question. Yeah, let's go to the hand in the middle over there. Thank you. What has been your favourite role to play outside of Shakespeare? Um, it would have to be Serrano. Have to be Serrano. It's a genius play. <coughs> Apparently, Rostand wrote 69 plays. Only two kind of survived. One is called L'Aiglon, um, which is about Napoleon's son. And the other is Serrano. Serrano is a five-act romantic drama, um, superbly written. And we had an um, Anthony Burgess translation, which was a fabulous translation, even to read it on the page was a moving experience. To actually get up there and say those words was extraordinary. Um, it is a wonderful play in that it, it has humour, oh, masses of humour, um, masses of romance and masses of heartbreak. And the fifth act of Cyrano de Bergerac, I defy anybody to survive. If, if, if the actor's got the first four acts right, by the time you get to the fifth act, you are so rooting for Cyrano. Um, and there is a wonderful moment when Cyrano is, has been attacked and he's dying. Um, he comes to see Roxanne, who for the last 15 years has been a nun. In, in a Carmelite uh, nunnery. And he comes in, she sits him down. Um, he, visit, he has visited over the years regularly. This time, she doesn't know it, but he's dying. He says, he asks her if she kept Christian's last letter to her. Christian was the beautiful young man um, that she was in love with and who loved her. Uh, but he had no soul, had no poetry, no, no romance, and Cyrano had written all the letters, of course. And, um, and she says, yes, of course, I've kept his letter. And she plucks it out of her bosom and starts to read it. And she gets two sentences in, and he starts saying the letter. And she suddenly realises that all these years it was him and if you've got it right, it's unbearable. It's unbearable. Um, but just a little jokey side to that. I'm playing Cyrano in the Gershwin Theatre on Broadway in 1984 with Jeanette Cusack playing Roxanne. And we get to that moment when I ask her, does she have the letter? And uh, she says, yes, of course she's kept his letter. Will you read it to me? Of course. And <laughs> <laughs> there is no letter. She hasn't sent the letter. What are we going to do? So she rushes into the wings, and the letter is on that side. <laughs> I'm sitting there, dying, literally. <laughs> All I can hear, now remember, Sinead is an Irish lass. All I can hear is, why the fuck's the letter? Why the fuck's the letter? Why the fuck's the letter? <laughs> she eventually finds the fucking letter. <laughs> and she comes back on, and she's in such a state that she's absolutely wonderful. She plays it superbly. I'm sitting there, rigid! <laughs> We get off, and um, 
She said, oh, I'm so sorry, love. I said, don't, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. It's fine, it's fine. We get back to the, the dressing rooms, and about 15 minutes later, there's a knock on my door, and it's Sinead with an actress who, in her day, was a famous method actress, a uh, name of Shelley Winters. Now, Shelley Winters was one of the Lee Strasberg ladies um, in the actor's studio in New York, famously method. And she came in, and, and Sinead said, Listen to Shelley. And apparently that moment was, for Shelley, absolutely real and absolutely wonderful. Because, of course, the woman was a nun. And she wouldn't be doing all this in front of uh, uh, Cyrano. Uh, of course she would leave the stage to get the letter and come back, decorously come back. So for Shelley, it was the hit of the evening. <laughs> So much for the method. <laughs> <laughs> Great, let's take another question. Um, let's go to the, the gentleman here on the second row, please. Thank you. Hey, so I think the first thing I saw you in was an episode of Frasier that you guest starred y in. Yes. Where you play the Shakespearean actor of questionable talent, Jackson Headley. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wondered what it was like for someone of your talent mm. to play such a bad actor. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. No, it was, it was um, that came out of the blue, actually, to be phoned up one day and said, um, they want you to, to play a part of a bad Shakespearean actor in an episode of Frasier. Uh, again, it was an offer you can't refuse, really. So I went out to Los Angeles and they were all very sweet to me. Um, it, it was... Uh, a bit daunting, I have to say, because uh, on the first read-through, you sit round the table, the cast all sits round the table, and right round the edge are all the producers, about 30 of them. Producers, writers, um, all the people who are writing the gags, they're all sitting there. And all the, the, the Chelsea Crammer and everybody there. And you've got to read and pray that these guys are going to laugh. And Kelsey starts, and they roar with laughter. And then um, Hyde Pierce comes in and he says some of his, and they're roaring with laughter. And they, they've all written it, of course. <laughs> 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 roaring with laughter. And then I say my first line, silence. My second line, silence. Third line, some gorgeous woman laughs. <laughs> And gradually they came round, gradually they came. And it was, it was a joy to do, a real joy. And uh, I loved it, I loved, I loved them. But, but that was a job out of left field, you know. Um, and, uh, but you see, all those, the, all those jobs where you think, um, uh, you know, would, would that further my career? To play a bad Shakespeare actor in Frasier? Yes, indeed. Yes. Got an Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yes, it was, it was great. It was a great time. Great. Let's go to the, the hand at the, the back over there. Um, I, Claudius, Hi. is my favourite programme ever, and I'm ex obsessed with ancient Rome, and it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and a few years ago, you returned to it to play Augustus in the radio programme, so I was wondering whether it was a particularly special story or book for you. Oh, very, very special, yeah. Um, well, what can I say? Well, I wasn't first choice by any means. They were scraping the barrel a bit when they got to me. Uh, the fir originally, they were going to have two uh, Claudii, a young, a young one and an old one. Um, and for the old one, who they wanted Charlton Heston. Um, and then, because the whole thing was owned by America. It was owned by London Films, which was an American company. Um, they didn't get Charlton Heston, so they, they went for Ronnie Barker. Um, and then, in, in some um, office discussion, my name came up, because I'd done a... Um, a piece of the BBC, the BBC Two called Man of Straw. Man of Straw was a Hein based on a Heinrich Mann novel. 
Uh, it was the sixth part of a BBC Two, and do, in it, I had to age from a teenager to uh, 60. Um, it was the same producer and the same director as I, Claudius. And they said, well, what about Derek? Uh, why don't we have one actor doing it, and we'll age him up? Uh, they said, fine. So they suggested wow. this to the Americans, who didn't know me from a hole in the ground. Um, so I was taken to dinner in an um, Italian restaurant in Shepherd's Bush to meet the representatives of London films. Um, that was the best performance I ever gave, I think. <laughs> um, I had to charm the bejesus out of them. Um, by the end of the evening, they said, OK, it's a, it's a risk, but we'll go with him. We'll go with him. Um, and for the next six months, we filmed it at, at the BBC. And it, to say that it changed my life is not quite true, but it certainly changed my career. Within two years, I was on Broadway. Um, um, and I'd done, what, six Paul Bay plays now, all stemming from Claudius. Um, I have to add that it was 41 years ago. It was 19, 1976. Uh, but it was, it was unique in that it was beautifully written. It was a wonderful script. Um, because when you read the books, the, the Graves books, there's, there's very, very little dialogue in them. It's mainly description. Um, and so Jack Pullman, who adapted it, had to create all this dialogue, which he did absolutely brilliantly. Um, I mean, for instance, Claudius um, is, doesn't say anything, I don't think, in either of the two books, but he's on every page because he's writing it. And um, it was full of uh, sort of old-fashioned television techniques then, long scenes, long takes. Um, and uh, it, it was in the days of uh, TV studios down in White City, so there wasn't much money available. Um, I remember I got an extra £600 at the end of it for my conduct at rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but so that it was, it was done on, on a shoestring. If you watch carefully, uh, when sometimes, not always, but a lot of the time, when we go from one scene to the other, we are actually in the same scene, the same set. The potted plants have moved. <laughs> That's how they change scene. And when we are in the Colosseum looking um, down at the gladiators, we are on a 10-foot rostrum, about twice the height of this, looking down at chalk marks on the floor where the gladiators are. The cameraman's lying on his back on the floor, looking up at us, so it looks as if we're up there. And all, all those wonderful sort of old-fashioned tricks. Uh, but the main thing was that it was, we were encouraged to be a kind of theatrical group, all those actors, uh, because the characters themselves were so <coughs> theatrical. It was a wonderful story, and the characters were so large than that. When you think of Johnny Hurt as Caligula, or Brian Blessed as Augustus, or Sean as Livia, um, they were huge, overblown characters that we were allowed to play like a theatre company, you know? And uh, it, it was wonderful, and it was, I think, actors... I think most actors would like to have um, a peak in their career. Some have more than one. Some have a, a whole lot layers of them. Um, one, one part that they are associated with, you know. Um, some don't get that part. As I say, some get more than one. Claudius was my one. <coughs> Claudius was the one that, that uh, uh, when people said, I, Claudius, uh, they thought of me. And that's, that's a, a great gift for an actor. Um, and it wasn't one that I was expecting uh, at all. So um, I, I bless Claudius. <laughs> Great. Let's take a few more <coughs> questions. Can we go to the hand there against the wall in the middle? Um, I was wondering, 
about your opinion on the phenomenon of so-called star theatre, especially in regards to what you said about Solange Olivier's appreciation of youngsters yeah. and the idea of star theatre as being something that we can use to get more young people coming to see theatre, but then it has been criticised for yeah. young people who don't truly and necessarily appreciate the theatre as a place to go and are complained of as being using their phones to film things and getting autographs and all that yeah. sort of stuff. I was wondering what your opinions on that it's might be. It's a good question. Um, it's, it saddens me that uh, one of the um, most lucrative hooks to get people to go to the theatre is to present somebody they've, uh, not necessarily a star, but somebody whose name they know. Somebody uh, whose stardom merely means that they have uh, appeared on telly, usually, maybe in a reality program, maybe in a dance program, maybe in a quiz program, but they are stars in the sense that they are, they are known. They're, what they look like and their name is known. But to, uh, to call that uh, a star performer, no, it, it's not, it's not. It's, it's a hook to get people in, into the theatre. Uh, it happens particularly at Christmas. Um, when all those pantos, you know, with uh, people you've never really heard of, but, um, but you've seen maybe on, on Strictly Come Dancing or something. Um, no, I, it's, a, it's a shame. There are, some, there are some real stars. There are the Judy Denches and the Maggie Smiths uh, and the Albert Finneys and, you know, who are truly uh, stars, um, who in their own right can attract people to the theatre, which is which is wonderful, um, but no, I no, I. Th the bottom line, of course, is we need bums on seats. We need people in the theatre. We need people to, to play to, to to work for, um, and if that is a way of of doing it, uh, it's as legitimate as any other, but it's not the real thing, no. In the front? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. You, you, <laughs> you've got a better view up there than I oh. have. Yeah. Next. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I know that you're a supporter of a uh, reasonable uh, 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 doubt theory of Shakespeare, so could you give us your main argument that it was Earl of Oxford? Uh, have you time rather? till midnight tonight? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, maybe one of, of them. <laughs> oh, it's a, such a huge question, as I'm sure you know. No, I, I am um, an authorship doubter. I, 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 don't, I do not say the Earl of Oxford wrote the plays, or Bacon, or Marlowe, or, or any of them, um, or several of them. We, d we do not know. What, what I would um, nail my, my flag to the mast to say, um, uh, along with uh, my, my other staunch support, it is Mark Rylance and I both say, it was not the man who lived in Stratford upon Avon. Um, there is a huge amount of evidence that it wasn't, that it couldn't have been. I, I really can't go into it now because we literally would be here for many hours. Um, but th there are, at the moment, many um, books on the subject. There's been a lot of research. At last, the subject is almost legitimate. It's still illegitimate. Um, what Mark and I would love is for the question to be legitimised so that we could actually debate it. But when we say what we say, we're, we're, they just throw mud at us. I mean, we've both been in the press uh, that we will end up in lunatic asylums. There, there is just vituperation. There is no debate. Uh, there is no evidence given. It is just, we are snobs, we are anti-Shakespearean. Uh, no, we're not anti we're anti Stratfordian, we're not anti-Shakespearean. Um, but it's, it's just, um, as I said, there's a lot of a lot of research being done. There's a lot of literature out there now, fascinating literature. Um, I, I would, anybody who's at all interested, I would say uh, an American um, author, um, uh, whose name, of course, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, I've forgotten, <laughs> um, called the unorthodox, Diana Price. Diana Price, Shakespeare's unorthodox biography. 
if you're at all interested in the subject, and she doesn't say it's the Earl of Oxford, it doesn't say any of that, she just traces the non-existent paper trail to the man from Stratford. Um, it's a fascinating book, and it's a wonderful, if you're at all interested, uh, it's a wonderful starter for 10, that book. It really is. Um, I, um, to my great regret, appeared in a film called Anonymous, um, which shot itself in several feet, uh, be <laughs> because uh, well, the, good, the good thing about Anonymous was that it got the authorship question up on a big screen for millions to see, millions who'd never even considered that the man from Stratford wasn't the author. So that was a plus. From there on, it was full of minuses, um, particularly the, the main one being that uh, they introduced what is known as the Prince Tudor theory. The Prince Tudor theory states that uh, Edward de Vere was the illegitimate son of Elizabeth by Thomas Seymour, who was then spirited away and brought up as the Earl of Oxford's uh, son, who then became the 17th Earl of Oxford, who then had an affair with his mother, <laughs> Elizabeth, and produced the Earl of Southampton. <laughs> now, that's silly. I mean, that's just <laughs> silly. That's silly. But that was one of the, the main th arguments of the film, which, which was sad because uh, it, it got the question up there, but, uh, but it um, reinforced all those people who said, look, there are a load of effing loonies. He, 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 he was Elizabeth's son, and then he, then he had an affair with her and produced it. It's ludicrous, and it is, I'm afraid, I think. It could be true, we don't know, but I don't think, don't think it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> For one or two more questions. Okay. Yeah, there's yeah. hands been yes, going up yeah. here. <laughs> Hi, I wasn't sure whether or not to mention this, but as you mentioned it in a story, I just wanted to say um, it's my 21st birthday today and it's an absolute privilege to be able to see you speak. Oh, okay. <laughs> Unlike Shirley Bassey, I'm not going to sing that. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. Um, what I wanted to say was you've talked a lot about all of the luck that you've had and all of the roles you've been really lucky to have. What yeah. about, are there any roles that you look back on that other people have done that you wish you'd been able to do? Oh, golly. Um, um, I, no, I, missed out, I missed out on Romeo, but I don't think I ever was a Romeo, really. Um, I've, always, I've always felt that I, I haven't got a suffering face. Um, <laughs> I've, I've always asked Father Christmas for cheekbones, and he's never sent them. Um, <laughs> Because, because there are certain parts you need cheekbones for, um, and I've never had them. No, I th I think if I'm honest, um, I've, I, I'm satisfied with the parts that's come my have come my way, and I haven't. I don't think I've ever really sat in the audience thinking it should have been me. I don't. Th if I'm honest, no, I can't. I can't say. I, I, I'm very satisfied with the, the parts I've done, and I, je ne regrette rien. <laughs> Great. Uh, we've got time for one final question. Let's go to. to, 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 to you, why don't you pick in your bird's eye view? Oh, uh, well, right down there. Yeah, make him work. Yeah, at the back. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. I'm glad to know I'm not the only one who thinks Cy Claudius is one of the best television series of all oh, time. Oh, bless your heart. Um, I was wondering what your best and worst memories were from the production of that. If you thought the c curse got, ever got to you, and if you're sick of talking about Claudius, I was also wondering what your mind's eye image of your mother of Ambitious is. Oh! Um, Considering we never see her and you always go on. Um. <laughs> What was the re what was the thing about vicious? I, I went uh, your mother's your because we never see her and you go on about her so much from vicious your mo your image of the mother on the end of the phone. You do see her. Oh, do yeah. She died in one of the thing. Oh well. <laughs> well, this when, is embarrassing. When, when <laughs> forget, forget that I talked about vicious. When Ian and, and I celebrated course. our anniversary, she collapsed and died. Mm, yes. Anyway, anyway. Um, Sorry. No. <laughs> Um, I, I, Claudius, was, was basically a, a joy, a joy throughout. I think one, one of the hardest things was um, 
at the, the beginning, um, I had to, the, the whole prosthetics thing, um, it took hours. This, this was, as I say, it's 41 years ago. They weren't so clever at prosthetics then. Um, I had to get into the dressing room at about 5 a.m. every morning to have the prosthetics laid on piece by piece um, with spirit gum and everything and then bled into each other so it looked like one uh, mask. Um, th that was bad enough, but during the course of the day, of course, um, so that it didn't crack, I could only... Um, I could have soup through a straw because I couldn't chew anything. I mustn't, um, because it, it did tend to crack around here when I spoke. Um, but then at the end of the day, to get it off was e even worse. That was, that was quite painful. Um, and we could only shoot me as uh, young Claudius. Uh, for, we always had to old Claudius uh, second because when I took it off, of course, I was, I was covered in sometimes uh, blood and spots and looked awful. Eventually, we found the best way of getting it off uh, was to lay in a hot bath full of stuff called badidas, which was a foaming bath thing, with a snorkel <laughs> and, and breathe underwater and gradually it would lift off. Somewhere in, a, in a, a drawer at home, I've got a mouldering full Claudius face that came off in one. Um, but that, that was, that was I think, the worst. And then, um, of course, it was the, the, the twitching um, was, uh, was very difficult at first. A, when you first see him as the old man, of course, he wasn't twitching nearly so much. When the first time you see him as a young man, he's twitching all over the place. The poor little boy who played me very young, um, we watched him one day in rehearsal and um, uh, Margaret Tyzak, who was playing my mother, said, uh, look, look at uh, Richard. And I said, yeah, he's, he's very good. He's, he's marvellous, isn't he? She said, no, 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 no. He's twitching the wrong way. <laughs> and the poor little boy, I'd started to twitch that way, and he was twitching that way. <laughs> and we told him about this, and he just did that. <laughs> I mean, it was, but the first time I did, I had to go and see the Sybil to find out what was going to happen to Rome. And uh, I said to the director, how do you, how do you gr greet a Sybil? And of course we didn't know, so we had to make something up. So it was you raise your hands high in the air and you bow your head, and then Hobie said, now, now do some twitching. So I started to, I wrecked my neck. Uh, so I had to wear one of those white collars um, for the first month. So uh, you can still actually, uh, when we filmed, of course, I had to take it off. But you can see the pain in my eyes as I'm twitching. Um, and immediately we finished, back when the neck brace. So they, they were the nasty moments. The rest was pure joy, pure joy. Great. Well, unfortunately, that is all we've got time for um, this evening. could ask that you please remain seated until after the speaker has left the room. But before that, um, please join me in thanking Sir Derek one final time for coming on today. Thank you.